Hey guys, welcome to. <laughs> What's that? What was that? that was I don't know. I'm not a musician. It's getting weirder and weirder. <laughs> Uh, so this is going to be like somewhere in the 10 to 15th kind of episode. Somewhere yeah. there. So you're getting into the experimental harmonica stuff now. You've gone wait, with wait, all wait your... Wait until we crack 50 episodes. Yeah, be... yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I'll be letting the wind blow into the harmonica and that'll be the intro. Yeah. <laughs> Alright guys, you already know what it is. The Caligram Podcast, aka Five Fun Film Friends Films Don't say podcast. it. That joke has got to go. It's not dead yet in but my heart. You could put that on like a t-shirt or something. You know? That's what, I, that's you what know, I'm keen you know. for. I'm thinking yeah. merchandising, the whole thing. Okay, okay, we're rambling here. Jack is already rolling his eyes. <laughs> um, today, we're here with Taylor Glockner. Yes, this is me, Taylor. Hello, what's going on? And Andre Tarkovsky. <laughs> Jigga Shimash. <laughs> that's, that's is, that, is that for that? <laughs> yes. I don't know how to speak Russian. <laughs> Something Noah again. doesn't know how to want, do. I don't want to, okay. Noah yeah. actually doesn't know how to do something. That's, that's in, it's a no, I, it's, I, I it's a calligram first. I thought surely you'd have like a hundred languages going around in that brain. We reached out to Tarkovsky as a guest, but we haven't heard back yet. So you're stuck with me. We're here today to talk about making the leap from Australia to LA. I know a bunch of my friends, they're keen to get into the creative industry Obviously, at the moment in the world, LA is the heart of it. It's a very daunting thing for a lot of people who know nothing about it, myself included. But luckily, we've got Taylor here. Taylor, you've been to LA almost a dozen times. Yeah, You lived there for a few years. Ten times back and forth. And, like, that's no big deal, really. And I think I'll probably have to go there, like, maybe another 30 times in my life. Um, it's just part and parcel in the industry to have to go back and forth from LA. And you boys, Isaac, Flesh and Ivory is having success. You've got other films that you're working on. Noah, you've got other films that you're working on as well. There's going to be some festivals like you were telling me that uh, in New York. Yeah, film festival hit us up. I don't know if we should name it. Oh, okay. Should no. we not? No, okay. Well, so, you know what? So, let's keep going yeah. and let's do our first bleep. Noah, you can bleep that festival. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, sure. The okay. podcast is, we, is we, naturally we've evolving. We've uh, two festivals in Brooklyn approach us. Okay. And we're actually really excited to see where that goes. Admittedly, I've never been to New York. I really want to go there. I know at some point it's probably likely that I will end up there for something. Maybe one of our film festivals, you know, that we're going to support one of our films in. So Taylor, you've made a lot of trips over there. You were you were pretty young, I think, when yeah. you made your first trip over there. What was that like? So the representation that I was with was very supportive of uh, me finding representation in America, mm-hmm. which was a good play. I remember, I think the first trip I made over there was in 2012. So I would have been 20 or 21. And I can already could already say the ways that LA has changed since 2012 to 2022. I remember you used to have to catch taxis in 2012 if you had, if you were going to an audition. Mm -hmm. And then I remember the first time I was with a friend and she called an Uber and I was like, what the hell did we just get into? (laughs) You just put something into your phone and a car showed up and we went on a ride in this car. Then you didn't give the driver any money. So like, how did, how did that work? And she was like, yeah, there's this new thing called Uber. So that would have been probably like 2016, I think. So it already had changed because in, in uh, 2012, it was all cash. You had to give you, you gave your taxi driver cash or you could pay with card as well. I have a horror story of, uh, well, here you go. You've got me going now. Um, I had this audition. This would have been one of my first times in LA. And I was staying at the Ramada Inn on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. And they have like a taxi rank down the bottom. And so I was heading to this audition and I got in this taxi and I told him the address and the guy put in the wrong address. And I tried to say to him, hey, I think that's the wrong address. But he said, no, 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 like, no, no, no. It's the right address. Don't worry, it's the right address. But I could see on his um, maps that he was driving me to another state. The, the, the trip was like 20 hours away. And I was like, dude, like maybe he was just trying to wind up the fare at that point. Yeah. You know? And 
I said, no, 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 this is meant, this is only meant to be like 15 minutes away. Like, what are you, what are you doing? He's like, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. And then it got to the point where like, I was like, dude, just turn around and just drop me back. <laughs> and I actually missed that audition. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. You're, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm in a taxi cab right now in a location that I don't really know mm. that well. In a place where everyone is like carrying yeah, as I mean, well. They, yeah, I mean, it's true. It's Second yeah. Amendment, right? Yeah. Can you talk about how you prepared yourself or how maybe your agency prepared you in mm-hmm. Australia to make that trip to America for the first time? What did you have to get sorted yourself? Yes. Or did your agency sort things for you? And then what did you prepare in Australia before preparing for the trip? Sure. So I went back and forth over a few years, but only for short trips. Mm -hmm. So that was good. It kind of, you know, opened my eyes to what to expect. And it didn't make it seem like such a big move when I did actually go over when I was staying over for 10 or 11 months at a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So firstly, I went over on what's called a waiver visa. Pretty sure it's called that. Uh, And that's just like a standard 90-day visa. Very affordable. Mm -hmm. Pretty cheap. You can go into... I don't know if this may have changed now because of COVID, but at the time, you could go in for up to 90 days. You could not do any work that would give you any like monetary compensation. Like I couldn't go and get a job washing dishes and then get paid. I don't know if you could do cash, but if you get caught, you get kicked out and you really don't want to get caught. So 90 day visa is the simplest visa to get. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, you have a work visa. There's many different kinds of like those work visas. For a period of time, I was on what's called an O1 visa, which is we were able to say, oh, you know, Taylor's done some work in Australia and he wants to audition in America. And he, you know, he's not going to come into your country and make problems and get into criminality and all these sorts of things. He, he's, he's worth having in your country. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not going to be a liability, basically, mm-hmm. in your country. Mm-hmm. So an O-1 visa is for an alien of, it's called legally, extraordinary ability. If you go on the forums on Google, you can see that a lot of people say, that I am not of extraordinary ability. <laughs> <laughs> you believe me, you can find these forums. Yeah. Uh, but Cut that's it. legally what it's termed as. Right, yeah. And then I was able to upgrade sort of my O-1 visa. You can get an O-1 visa for up to three years mm. where you can accept to be paid for work as a creative. So if a studio puts you on a project as an actor or as a creative, whatever that is, you can receive money for that legally, which is a bit of a catch-22 to be on the O-1 visa because now you're in America looking for the gig, yet you can't work another job to to sustain to sustain yourself yeah, to right. pay for yourself to be there so you're running on savings right so how long can you run on savings for mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is it is very very tough and there's so, also yeah. the um you got to transfer it to US and the Aussie dollars not to that's the other thing crash up in 2012 let me tell you this i went over and the Aussie dollar i think was stronger was more dense at the time than the US dollar. So one Aussie dollar was getting me a dollar 12 US and everything is cheaper in the US generally anyway. So I could go to Subway and get like a foot long sub, like two cookies, a big Coke, and it would cost me like $7. Wow. Nice. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to be easy. You know? (laughs) (laughs) And then over the course of the next five years the us dollar went from being like a dollar 12 all the way down to i want to say like into 60 cents yeah it was i think 67 cents so what is that that's 45 cents it dropped and when i upgraded my o1 visa into a green card and i'll explain the benefits of a green card I paid for the legal fees when the dollar was at 67 cents, not at a dollar 12. But I just had to go through, I just had to do it at the time, you know? So yeah, I mean, you just have to do what you have to do. But if you do want to pay legal fees, it would have been great to do it in 2012 when I was getting a dollar 12 per dollar, you know? Yeah. So my agency that was representing me at the time were 
really saying get an O1 visa or if you want to get a green card mm -hmm. and we can put you in touch with immigration lawyers who can uh, organize this for you. There's no guarantee, but we think that you've done enough work in Australia where that if you put the package together, you, you will be approved. There's also the green card lottery that people apply for that there seems to be like no rhyme or reason. Like you hear people apply for it first time and then they win it the first time they apply and then other people that say i've been applying for the green card lottery for 20 years and still haven't won it there's it's just luck i guess that's did, why they call it a lottery <laughs> did your agency suggest to you to go over to la or did you make that push i think it was both yeah. uh, i think it was the logical next step mm -hmm. because i'd done quite a bit of work in Australia uh, and the stuff that I was working on in Australia was being distributed internationally anyway. So we were like, let's go there and let's go there young. I remember being told when I was in my early 20s during the time I was in LA that a young actor in LA is 35 years old. That's what they said. Mm. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm like 23. Right. You know, so I've got plenty of time. Sure. So I worked on Mako Mermaids after Neighbours and Mako was about two years of work um, and it was on the Gold Coast. So mm -hmm. I was driving an hour and back from my place in Brisbane right. while I was shooting it. And, you know, you guys might not know this about me, but we wrapped on a Friday on Mako and on Monday, I knew that I was going to be with these lawyer fees and with the, the dollar being at 67 cents. So I wrapped on Mako on a Friday and on Monday I was working on the docks with my brother-in-law. Wow. wow. Yeah, saving yeah. up for these lawyer fees. I sure. think it ended up being probably about oh, like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12,000 Australian dollars wow. to apply for this green card, which I did get approved. Good. By the way. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. First time. Nice. Um, I had to do a lot of put this package together, I guess the immigration lawyers, it was accepted mm -hmm. from the work that they did on it. Right. The other thing is that processing can take a period of time. So I knew that it was going to take six months and I had the money, but I just, I was thinking to myself, if you're going to be waiting for the processing for six months, you should get a job. Doesn't matter that you've worked on shows or whatnot. Sure. Just get a job. My brother-in-law helped me to work with him on the docks. And then all that money that I earned in that six months, I don't know, maybe it was like 15, 20 grand or something. I just put straight across onto the legal fees of the green card. Mm -hmm. Also, it's quite expensive wow. getting back and forth from LA. Yeah, that's the that's, wise. that's a lot. I'm thinking for like a young working actor. So you've got to pay for flights, accommodation. So I was green card if you want to make the investment. Live within your means. And I know yeah. I've, I've said this before to you guys that I, like we were saying the other day, I still drive my first car. I'm just yeah. taking care of it, you know? I really believe in living within your means. You, some actors get a job and you earn really good money at the time and you think, that's it, like, I'll never have to work again. And then they just don't do anything and spend all their money. But what I have always tried to do is if I'm working on a creative gig, I'm getting paid really well. And if I'm not working on a creative gig, I'm still working and getting paid. But that's me. I mean, you know, you guys know me. Like, I just like to stay active. Yeah, no, absolutely. So then you moved to LA. Yeah, I think I was 24. Uh -huh. And I up and moved. I had been there probably about four or five times for like two or three weeks at a time. Gotcha. Um, but I would never have, have said like it was actually living there. Mm -hmm. But then I flew over there. My buddy John Kim uh, and some other guys I stay with, Aaron Jacobanko and Micah Tutu, they let me stay on their couch. Nice. And I was probably in the way, you right. know. Um, <laughs> and, I out, and I completely outstayed my welcome, right. you know. Um, I actually moved, ended up moving from the couch into um, one of their spare bedrooms. We were all in a share house, a four-bedroom place. And... Uh, we were all just auditioning all the time, having a great time, mm -hmm. trying not to spend too much money. Mm -hmm. It was really, really fun. You know, I wouldn't change it for the world, that experience of being in my 20s. And then the thing with the green card is that you can work when you have a green card, not on something creative. Right. right. So I went and got a job in a gym because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, all right, free gym membership. Nice. Great. Yeah. So now I can work out for an hour or two a day. Mm -hmm. It needed to be a job within walking distance because I did not want to outlay the money for a car. Sure. So I went and got this uh, job at a gym, which I did get fired from because I left 
a shift early one time to go to an audition. Oh, wow. Did you get the part? No. <laughs> oh, shit. But, you know, I wasn't in LA to be working in a gym. I was um, in there to be auditioning for things. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, d- I didn't really care either. When I... <laughs> so they had me, like, on um, video camera. They were like, Taylor, like, you left your shift. You were meant to finish at 9, but you left at 8. 53. Oh, no way. To Seven go, minutes. I, I, I wasn't going to an audition that night. I ditched because I needed to go home to learn it, you know? Right. It was something unreasonable. Like that. Seriously. Seven. Seven. I thought you Seven. were going to tell me you left like 90 minutes early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No, I didn't. No. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's ridiculous. That's just... That's how just long, how long had you been working at the gym? Oh, about 18 months or something like that. So when HR actually called me in... It's crazy. Yeah. When I've done H- worse than that. I know. <laughs> When HR called me in to say to me, basically, oh, we're going to like just pay you out for the week because they, they pay bi-weekly. Mm. We ended up spending like 20 minutes talking about how her daughter was a fan of Mako Mermaids before she said, oh, and hey, by the way, the reason I've got you in here is because like we're firing you because you left early. Oh, that's for this nice audition. of her, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> My daughter's such a huge fan, by the way. <laughs> You're yeah, fired. And I said, I was like, how much? Go, I go, said, go live in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said, how much do you think really that, that seven minutes cost? I will take my card out right now and swipe on that. What, what do you want? I was honestly, I was earning like $11 US an hour. Mm. Overall, my whole experience in LA, I would say that I really did break even. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't come out up, but I certainly didn't come out down. Mm-hmm. Because I worked my ass off at jobs while I was in America to sustain myself. Right. Whereas a lot of my friends didn't really work jobs. They would just audition and party. Mm-hmm. And I worked and auditioned and partied. Right. But I worked really, really hard. So I said, how much those seven minutes do you really think that like that's worth? I'll take my card out right now and I'll swipe on that. And she said, oh no, like it doesn't matter. Like It's not applicable now. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Like, whatever. I don't, I don't give a shit anyway. Sure. Oh, and, and okay. Admittedly, I did spend a lot of time in the break room, not actually working and watching <laughs> Better Call Saul. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so there might have been a little that bit. That sounds of, fine by me. There might have been a I'll little. I'll let bit. that slide. That's a good cause. <laughs> when you're my boss, you're like. Taylor, watch as much better calls as well. <laughs> yeah, you want. like Taylor, let me know when you're doing that, and I'll come watch it with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that I was, like I was being okay in the gym as that. an Australian and like chatting with people? Do people? What's it like having the accent over there? Does it really get picked up that much? Like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, for sure it does. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. There was also cultural things about America that I learned about. That's not just the accent sounding different even that there's like some words that they use that we don't use and vice versa. Like I remember someone asked me a question, like I can't remember what the question was. It was a question with regards to quantity. It was like, how much of that do you have? And I said, heaps, heaps. And um, they were like, what does heaps mean? <laughs> really? oh, oh, you mean a lot? You mean a lot? Seriously? Yeah. They don't, they don't have heaps. Maybe if they don't have to, heaps. They didn't. They don't have heaps. Maybe if you went to uh, to England, they might have heaps. Oh, that's, yeah, England's much more crossover. You yeah. think? Yeah, that's absolutely. crazy. They don't call. Okay. They call fortnightly, bi-weekly, bi-weekly, bi-weekly oh. fortnightly. What are you talking about? Talking about Fortnite. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fortnite was not a thing. It I wasn't. Think. No, no, nah, not, not until yet. a bit later. So there were some cultural things, and then the accent definitely was picked up quite a bit by Aussies, by people from England who are in America, by mm. Americans. How often were you asked to do an American accent for auditions? Quite often, uh-huh. which it's not really hard for an Australian to do an American accent, I don't think, but no one can sort of reverse engineer and do an Australian accent if you're not from Australia. Many have tried, and I don't think it's actually been 100% pulled off. It's, the be- it's, the closest... It's definitely more rare than the reverse. I've seen many a poor Australian accent from an American actor in yeah. a movie, like, yes. over and over again. I've, I've seen it. It's like they're basing it on Australian movies and yes. not Australian people. <laughs> that That's the big problem. Like, everyone tries to sound like Croc Dundee. Yeah. And, like, and that's actually just not, none of us talk like Croc know, Dundee unless no. you go out. Look, the closest anyway. that we've come 
is I would probably say Meryl Streep did an Aussie accent in something. I, I, can, I could look it up. And that's been pretty damn well received, mm-hmm. but not perfect. And also, Robert Downey Jr. did an Australian accent. Um, like he's done a couple of times. He did. And natural, it's very, very, very close. Killers. Yeah, in Natural yeah. War. Is it? Yeah. Very, Maybe very, very close. close. Yeah. It's pretty good. It's very commendable. It's pretty damn good. Try. You also then have Jude Law trying to do Australian in in the in Contagion. I haven't seen Contagion. Which I oh, don't I've know. I've seen Contagion, but I don't remember the accent. There you go. Uh, what I will say is that it's easier to do an American accent than it is to go back and do an Australian accent. Right. That's for sure. I, I'm bringing this up because I've definitely heard from casting directors in Australia that Americans... That there's a thing where Americans don't like the Australian accent and they don't like putting it in their movies and things like this. Fair enough. Yeah. I so, think that mm. that might be changing. Like, mm-hmm. there's a lot more... You're hearing a lot... Is it just me or you're hearing a lot more accents in, in movies these I days? Like, there sure. was an Aussie in that uh, in the Tom Cruise movie, um, Edge of Tomorrow. There was an Aussie guy. Oh, that was a while ago. But yeah, no, I definitely think it's, you know, there's more nowadays. So yeah. maybe it won't be such a big thing that will hold you back if you go, if you go over there. For sure. Know? Look, what I will say is that I went into audition rooms being American mm-hmm. but if uh, being Amer- so you would go in with an American accent pretending to yeah I would American? go in if it, if it was American if it was in American accent I would just go oh, in being American okay, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> but next time I go into the room in LA because it's been a couple of years since I've been there I think the last time I was there was late 2019 and then then in early 2020 I was down in Sydney and then COVID happens mm-hmm. I haven't gone back to LA for a couple of years because I've just been in Australia so I've grown up a bit. So the next time that I'm in the room in LA, I would be more believing in myself to just be Aussie and, and do the audition in American. So if you weren't asked to do an accent, sometimes you would do the American accent anyway. No, no, no. They'll tell you on the brief. Oh, like this is like, okay. no doubt, this is US accent. Sure, this sure. is UK accent. This is Australian accent. I thought you were saying that you would like fake an American accent and go into the room and introduce yourself like as an... I would. If, oh, would? If, it, if, it, yeah, if it's, if it's oh, wow. US, no, if it's a US guess... accent, I would, because then you don't want them to like sit back and be like, well, I heard there's a problem here. Whereas if you yeah. if you, you made a mistake here, whereas if they never know that you're Australian... I actually, I actually wow. that's, that's very clever. That's hilarious. Yeah. There you That's go. Great. And then they watch one interview now, but fair enough. Yeah, like, you know like, what I mean? Well, yeah, because it sounds like there's the assumption now that you're putting it on. Yes. Yeah, that's totally. right. Right. That's clever. So I would go in just being so uh, just being American mm-hmm. or just being Australian or just being English, mm-hmm. which I'm not as good at doing the, the English accent. I can do it off the page sure. um, <laughs> once I've prepared it, mm-hmm. but I probably wouldn't want to freestyle in, in the English accent. Right. That's more difficult. But you never got anybody pulling you up on it or saying that it wasn't believable. Or nobody said, You're not really American. No, not really. But I, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty easy cool. to like go like... Even when I was working at the gym, I would just sell to people in an American accent just because it was easier for them to, like, take the sale. There you go. And it worked. Yeah, you found it, that worked. it worked. I would, do, I would practice by doing, like, full tours of the gym mm-hmm. in American accent. And then if I was being lazy one day, I'd just be Australian accent. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, just in terms of, like, it bridges the gap. Because Americans find it difficult sometimes to understand the Australian accent. Sure. They really do. Yeah. And that's kind of understandable, mm-hmm. you know. It's like us with the Scottish accent. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. right. So I would do it almost just as a favor so that you can just understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm talking like in your language. Mm-hmm. Of you course. Know? So with regards to doing things like practicing your accent mm-hmm. while on the job, mm-hmm. did you ever have things like, oh shit, well maybe I can't leave my shift uh, I can have like a script behind the counter if you're trying to learn. Oh yeah, slides all of that. And... All of that. Well, because for auditions, they're like, well, would you ever work in character, depending on the on the character? Like, no, like, like, because I've I've just seen. I'm. It just shows how much I how little I know about the experience. I just see in movies. It's always like the the working young actor is always like saying their lines in the car and like holding up traffic yeah, or you yeah, know yeah. trying to be in character on the job or doing an accent or so i i don't know if this is because i've kind of been you know in and around the industry since i was 17 18 i don't do it outside uh anymore because i don't need i don't want people to see that i have an audition scene yeah that i'm practicing 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but people I could understand who are very early on in the process who, you know, you go to a cafe and there's like someone set up with a laptop with a paperweight on a script and the pages are blowing everywhere and they're working on their audition scene in the middle of Starbucks. That's not about yeah. them not having the right location or place or maybe a room that they can't go to to work on that scene. That's about them wanting everyone to see that they have an audition. Yeah. yeah. I wonder that sometimes because you see people working... I don't get it. The whole bringing your laptop to the cafe. I've never understood that. I, I've never understood that either. And I can't work there. I've got my office at home. That's my, like, what where I work from. Yeah. You know, I can do all my work from there. I'll rehearse, like, very privately. Maybe if we organize a space to rehearse in for whatever we're working on, I'll show you what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. But I won't be on the street uh, rehearsing because I don't want people to see, oh, that's Taylor. And that guy wants people to know that he's an actor. Yeah, okay. I don't. It's a real I don't need movie, to. Movie like, yeah, it's really cringe. Like, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I like. I want to be like the normalist about it that you could be. Yeah. Like, so I don't show off that I'm rehearsing or that I have an audition or anything like that. I just do it all very, very privately, and I don't need anybody else to know about it mm-hmm. um, because that shit, I reckon, is just cringe. <laughs> So when you were in America, you got yourself American representation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, first of all, how did you get that? So the way I got that was uh, a meeting was set up from my representation in Australia at the time. And we went through half a dozen possible options. Mm -hmm. And then for various reasons, uh, maybe we already knew these guys or we knew of them or another client was with them from the same agency, Mm -hmm. we did land on some good rep in the US. So the the idea, at least my plan, when I was 25, 26, and when I was in America, is that you want a sort of three representation structure. You want your Australian representation. Mm -hmm. In America, there's a difference between managers and agents. The managers, really, it's in the title, they manage you. And your agent gets you a lot of auditions. Mm -hmm. Your agent still manages you, don't get me wrong. But the idea, I think, is that the manager does like 80% of the management between all of your representation. Mm -hmm. And the agent just gets you auditions like wildfire that you can just pick if you want to go for or if you want to pass on something. Your manager can still get you auditions, don't get me wrong. Or your Aussie reps can still get you auditions as well. Everyone works together. And there's no rules. You know, however the gig comes up, but that's generally how it is. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really trying to set up the three representation kind of structure, which would be Australian reps, American manager, and then an American agent. In Australia, you don't really need a manager and an agent. You just can have someone that can cover both of those jobs, essentially. I remember it was late 2016, I was 25 years old. Some of the major companies in LA, the majors are like WME, UTA, CAA, ICM. I took a meeting with, now I can't say this agent's name. We'll go back to episode one, um, the terms and conditions episode. I said everyone was going to be Bob Bob. (laughs) because I can't give names. I uh, made an agreement with Bob at ICM, which was one of the majors, Mm -hmm. one of the top four representation companies in the world, Mm -hmm. in this industry. And he said, yeah, like, I think it was maybe like November and I was gonna go home for the summer. Mm -hmm. And then I was gonna come back in February and we were gonna do pilot season. Taylor, like February, next year, we're a go. I had Bob at ICM ready to rep me and I had my plan executed. I was 25 years old, my three representation structure plan. I go back February the next year. First of all, I'm thinking to myself, Taylor, I did not know anybody in this industry. I did not have parents who were in this industry. I just had a love of media and I just started going in this direction. I find myself at 25 years old signing a deal with ICM in another country, Mm -hmm. having done quite a bit of work to stand on in order to get that deal, shake hands with Bob, 
go home for two months, enjoy the summer, come back February the next year. Then we're emailing Bob, my Australian reps and my American manager. Nobody can find Bob. Where's Bob? The guy has disappeared off the face of the earth after my deal had been set up. What? The Me Too movement. Oh. oh. This guy got Me Tooed. I wasn't to know. So suddenly he wasn't working at ICM anymore and the whole deal fell through. It was like my it was like a huge achievement. That's insane. And then a huge letdown. If he had not have been me too, if it had have been another agent, then I'm in my late twenties and who knows how that turns out. I was able to still make a deal with another agent who was in the middle tier but not in the top tier where ICM is. Mm-hmm. And that went okay for a little while. But then when COVID hit uh, and I came back to Australia, I knew that I needed to reshuffle and reorganize my whole team. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I don't want to sound ruthless, but I started again from the very beginning with my whole team. Wow. I changed my Australian reps Mm -hmm. and now I am restructuring my representation all over again. Right, right. But... Had Bob not have been doing, you know, I don't even know what, whatever he was doing. Sure. And had not have been having to run and hide, uh, then I think that could have been a very fruitful business relationship. But it wasn't to be. What can yeah. you do? Also, if he's getting me too, it's probably not the guy you want to work with. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, but, what is, <laughs> yeah. but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, what if it had have been just another if he agent? Had a, yeah, yeah, if he'd just been a good... Because I'm not to know, I don't know this guy from Joe Blow, like, you know, so how could that have turned out? That's just, that's really, really unfortunate. Maybe, maybe, I mean, who knows? It's, it's, I guess it's strange that your, um, deal didn't get passed on. He was his agent. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Hang on a minute. Maybe we should totally. So in the team of agents, Mm -hmm. they had. Right. At that, at, at ICN. It's strange that your, um information or your deal or whatever didn't get passed on to an agent who wasn't you know (laughs) look what that may have been is that i met with bob shook his hand and he took me at what i was from a face-to-face meeting sure but that that was not able to translate by moving across to another agent right we weren't able to sustain that and look everyone knows in this industry everything is about relationships some things are tenable across certain relationships and some things aren't and i guess that one just wasn't yeah So then coming back to Australia in, you know, kind of 2019, meeting you guys. So I was coming back and my thought process was, I do not want to rely on factors that I cannot control, like Bob and the Me Too movement. So my thought process is, you need to start again from the ground up Mm -hmm. and build again with factors that you can control, with people that you can trust and We formed Caligram very soon after. I think that a really good way to do it is in forming your own production company, running your own productions, and you can have an eye over everything that's happening, and maybe control is a strong word, but you can control everything that's happening, Mm -hmm. all of your projects. So there's going to be no, as Danny uh, described the other day, no little firecrackers that are going to pop up out of nowhere and and ruin your shit. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? Well, you didn't you didn't know that about me. I've no, never told no you idea. that story. I had no idea. That's, can, can you believe that? That's really. I'm not gonna say it's that unfortunate because I think you're in it still in a good spot. Yeah. But yeah. like obviously there's some potential loss there. That's For really sure. sad. Yeah. Look, I so a lot of my friends. I, I know a lot of uh, friends who went over and found a gig, and a lot of friends who went over and didn't find a gig. I did do work over there, but nothing like a huge seven year deal on a like a TV series or anything. But what I did make in LA is a lot of great contacts that I still utilize today Mm -hmm. and a shitload of life experience and some hilarious stories as well. Had a lot of fun. It was like a working holiday, if you will. Sure. Um, I worked really, really hard, but I played really, really hard as well. Cool. Yeah. And Isaac, I'm looking at you. (laughs) Why not Noah? Noah party's the most out of all three of us. That California kush... <laughs> is, gonna, I've I'm heard it's try quality. I've you've heard, heard, you've heard good things. About I've it. heard it's quality, and that's no. all I'm gonna say. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Is the auditioning? So I'm sure you guys remember that 
in previous podcasts I've said yeah. what great experience I've had auditioning in Australia. I'm, I'm asking this knowing this a little bit, but I'm hoping to get some stories and stuff. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so that, oh, you want stories? A little bit, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that's, that, that's, that's what we're here for. Yeah. We're going to have to yeah. go with a few more bobs, though. Maybe give, that's fine. Maybe give the listeners just a little bit of a, if there's actors listening, just a bit of an overview of what they can expect if they've only auditioned in Australia and how that might be different to America. And then we'll get into some stories. There can be things about sometimes a cast. It's, you know, sort of like sometimes... Okay, I'm going to get into controversial territory here. Okay. You know when, like, there's a policeman who's, like, going off and you're like, dude, like, that's just about you, like, being on a power trip. Sure. Yeah. You know? Right. Right, you can right. keep that in. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Sometimes, like, casting directors can get on a power trip. Right. And it's like, well, that's about you. Like, that's about <laughs> you and you. This got nothing to do with me. Gotcha. You know? Yeah. When that happens, I just lay low and I just like, yeah, whatever, man. It's all good. So did I tell you... I did tell you that story about the time I went in and uh, the guy was like, I would say don't decide how you're going to do it before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was one story. That wasn't actually a casting guy. That was a director mm-hmm. who was in the room. But there is... <laughs> so there is another story. I can't even remember her name. So it's going to have to be Bobette. Um, maybe I had an audition at like 10 a.m. Mm. And I rocked up because I had nothing else to do that morning. So I was punctual. You know, I like to be punctual. Mm -hmm. There is a bit of a thing about auditioning. You don't actually want to show up too early. You don't want to show up too late either. Like just get there like maybe three minutes before you got to go in. Three? I reckon, I reckon I've I've whittled it down. Do not be there like 10, 15 minutes early. Not even 10, 15 not only can you psych yourself out, but I think you look maybe like a little bit too desperate. Yeah, like like not knocking on the door, but like being in the wet, maybe the holding room. These days, I wouldn't even want to be seen in the holding room 10 to 15 minutes before. I used to be though, okay. when I was a bit younger. But now I would just hold back a little bit and maybe hide in like the hallway or, or like the stairwell or something like that until sure. like three minutes before and then go in. Being too early can be just as counterproductive as being too late in terms of the look of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so I was at this audition, it was 9.45 a.m. And I got in there at like Mm 9.45 and I was the first cab off the rank to to read for this part. Right. And it was like kind of a big office space and I could tell I was in the waiting room and it was only me. And there was another lady in the back room and she was on the phone. Have I told you guys this story? I've heard this story privately. Okay. Okay. I I don't think I've heard this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And she was talking Like, just nonsense. Like, just... You know when you think, like, a big personality, that's what she was. Like, big and boisterous. She was like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, the only person who can save this project is me. I'll give her a call. I'll see if I can... You know, like, oh, yeah, well, that's going to be my autobiography, but we can't publish that until I die. You know, shit like that, she was saying. Like, if if for me to publish, I'd have to be dead. You know, like, that's the shit she was saying, like... And so I'm like just waiting, you know, like at this young guy, like kind of, you know, shy. I've prepared it. I'm going to go in. I'm going to give the best read I can possibly give. And she's there and she like hangs up the phone. She's like, fine, whatever. I'll make the call later. I'll make the call later. And she like smacks like the phone down. Wow. With you in the room? I was down the hallway. Yeah. Okay. In the waiting room. Did she know you were there? She didn't know I was there. I, I don't think. What a show. Yeah. <laughs> and it was only her. So maybe that tells me that it, that, that was just her. Yeah, probably. You know? Yeah. And so then she keeps typing, working on, on her desk, whatever she was doing. And then comes down the hallway and sees that I'm in the waiting room. And she was like, oh my God, you're here? She didn't know who I was. She was just like, you're here? Why didn't you come into my office and tell me that you're here? I could have been dead in there. I could have been in great pain, sick. What the f- what the fuck? And, and, and I'm, and so I'm like, care of? <laughs> so I'm in the waiting room, right? And I'm thinking, that just does not seem plausible to me. Like, you want me to help myself <laughs> into your office and then help myself down your hallway, through your waiting room, and then into your office when you're on the phone and say yeah, hello. You would have told me to fuck off. Yeah. yeah. Fucking oath. Get you out. Know, get out. You on the phone. Yeah. 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 Who... Who are you? I, I couldn't win. If I had have done that, she would yeah. be like, who are you? Get the fuck out of here. I'm like, She would have been like J. Jonah Jameson. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Parker. Yeah. <laughs> so no matter what I did, I it was one of those situations where I wasn't going to win. Yeah. Right? So what, what was the audition like after that? So she was like, all right, well, come on, let's read. So we go in there, go into this little room. Yeah. And I do, I can't even remember the material. I, I think it was like two scenes. I do it. It was pretty much what I rehearsed. It was pretty good. 
And she's like, okay, what's your name? Taylor. Taylor, you're quite good, Taylor. I'll never forget that's what she said, right? But I didn't get the part or anything. I never heard from her again. Thank God. And then so um, <laughs> the audition ends and I go back out into the hallway and I'm walking through the waiting room and now there's like some more young guys in the waiting room. Sure. And as I'm going out the door, she says, okay, who's next? You. Who the hell are you? <laughs> to the next guy. <laughs> and she calls him in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and as I'm going, she doesn't have a schedule. Like, like no, I don't know. Name, she, so. just, she just pointed at the guy. You, who the hell are you? Get in here! And I was just like, what the heck? And I was just like, that. I don't even know what that was. Oh my gosh! Sure. If, if yeah. you if you put her on the New York subway at 11 p.m., it still <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same like yeah. energy. Same energy. Yeah. So that honestly happened to me. A, about five years ago and I still think back on that and laugh I can still see the room the whole experience would have probably taken about 10 minutes right and I have not forgotten about that there's 999 other auditions I did in LA I probably could not even remember 800 of them that being said I did also have great (laughs) auditions in America Mm -hmm. where a different casting lady called me into the room. She was like, hello, Taylor, how are you? She didn't actually know like who I was. She just saw that my name was Taylor. She was very personable. And like, I did a read. I didn't overdo it. I did like 80%, 90%. Cause you, in America, by the way, you can hold your pages in your hand oh, there you go. while you read. And it's not seen as like uh, a show of disrespect. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Australia, you probably don't want to be holding no. your pages. You want it, you have it learned a hundred percent. If you don't have your pages, is it seen as just, you're just confident or is it almost like cocky? If you don't have your page, see, I've been told, even if you know it off by heart, if you're in America, hold your pages. Just because you get flustered, maybe. They say that if you do it without your pages in America, that's a show of that you've decided how you're going to do it and you're not going to be able to change the way that you're doing it. Oh, that's, weird. That's the way that it's perceived. Whereas if you have your pages in your hand, it's still, you know, you're still like figuring it out and it's just kind of, let's just give it a read. Right. Oh. And then if you take me to the next step of the audition, then the pages will go away and then we'll do it. Yeah. Interesting. That's strange, man. I wouldn't ever audition someone like that. I, I, I can't <laughs> imagine somebody having it be memorized as a negative ever. No. But it's about turnover because in America you audition for so many things that it, it is like every day or every two days. So right. you, you cannot, you probably the most of the time, yeah. you are going to have to be referring to the page. Sure, sure. And I really try not to refer to the page, but sometimes I, I, I you have no choice. Mm-hmm. Like if you want me to do 10, 12 pages of dialogue <laughs> Shit. overnight, like I'm sorry, I'm going to have to lean on the page a little bit. Yeah, don't say Fair enough. You know? So what are some of the other, like, you know, we have these crazy stories that are like one in a million that are very memorable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the general differences between Australian auditions and American auditions? Like 99% of the time, what should people be? So we've got the thing with the pages, but what are people like? Yeah. I don't think I've had a bad experience auditioning in Australia. Right. Um, Do they give you more time? Actually, that's not true. I have had a bad experience auditioning in Australia. It was an American in Australia. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh. Okay. I'm getting a general gist that, you know, the American casting directors or whoever's in that room are harsher than they are in Australia. You're more cannon fodder in America. Okay. Especially in LA, mm-hmm. you know. It's just like, you know, get him in, get him out. Okay, I've seen you. Okay, next. Right. It's like... It's like La La Land. Yeah, yeah, really. Like, that's... The reason that that's in there is because that's kind of a true thing. So you have to not take that personally, but it's really hard not to take it personally because you are, as you guys said in in a previous podcast, when you do a scene, you're showing emotion. You're showing the emotion that 99% of people hide. Yeah. Yeah. They don't bring this emotion out. They hide it. Like, I've heard, um, as Peter Rasmussen taught me... Mm -hmm. Actors are emotional firefighters. We run towards the burning building, not away from the burning building. 99% of people run away from it. Mm. So you're going into this room that's a completely, what would you call it, Noah? Like a created, premeditated experience, planned, scheduled experience. And then bearing your deepest emotions, Mm -hmm. hoping that 
you're synced up and you hit all of the moments that are in the scene for strangers in a good way for strangers who you for free for free (laughs) getting fired from your job because you left seven minutes (laughs) early yeah you know and then the likely outcome is that they're going to criticize you for it yeah or you're never going to hear from them again I'm not complaining. I've had many good experiences, bad experiences, and everything in between. And the bad experiences now, me at 31, looking back on auditions that I took when I was 23, 24, 25, 26, it's funny like to me now. And all I know is that when I'm, well, I'm kind of getting into like more and more into elements of producing and running Caligram now with you boys. Mm-hmm. When I'm on that side, I know that I'll be more personable. Mm with my actors because i've been an actor yeah Yeah. and i don't even have to have been a great whether i like one of my favorite actors is brian cranston like he was a journeyman he was in the game for a long time and then does breaking bad when he's in his mid 50s you know i'm 31 you know like who knows where i'm gonna i could go nowhere i could go everywhere who knows right but even from being a, a pretty good actor you don't have to be a great mm. from having that experience. You still know that when you're on the other side as a producer, maybe you're doing, you're not a casting agent or a casting director, but you're in the room to have a look at, you know, the talent, the acting talent that's coming through the door. I know I'm going to be so much more personable. Mm-hmm. Like I'll jump up there and I'll be like, okay, so here's kind of this, uh, how he's feeling. You ready? And let's run it and be really giving mm-hmm. to the actor. It's the same thing, and I've touched on this with you guys in the past, like there's no correlation or I think there's little correlation between good sports players and then good sports coaches. So you can be an average player and be a great coach. Mm. Being a great player does not mean that you're going to be a great coach. So for me, even to be a pretty good actor, I think with all of the uh, emotions that I've experienced as an actor, that's not the word that I'm looking for, but it, it, it will work. I know what that feels like so that when I'm in the coaching position, I'll be a lot more empathetic for the actor. Mm. And, but I would not know that if I went straight to being a coach. Mm. So everything that I've done is deductible, you know, like tax deductible. I joke with Harley that I call it acts deductible. Mm -hmm. Everything you do is deductible back into future experience. Yep. Whether you're winning or losing or whatever, it informs your experience in the future to do even better, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's not even, I could, oh, bro, I could go on and on. What do you guys, you got more questions or what? I get it. I'm sure I can go. Yeah. You ready to go? we got time, dude. If there are actors listening to this mm-hmm. and they want to make that trip out to LA and they want to start like auditioning for stuff, like that's their plan. They're going to go over there. They're going to do a bunch of auditions and they're going to try and get something. Mm-hmm. Are there like key pieces of advice that you wish that you knew that you wish somebody told you before you headed off? Yeah. I mean, I picked this up pretty quickly, but, uh, live within your means. Yeah. But when you're over there, you also want to, you know, you're like, Oh my God, like I'm in another country. I'm in another city. Like I want to go and have some experiences of, of this place as well. So you do spend a little bit of money as well because you know, you're taking it all in. But my main advice would be live within your means. You know, some of my friends over there were saying, oh, like we just moved here and we're going to outlay $20,000 to buy a car. Whereas I went the other approach where I was thinking, okay, I'm going to get a job that is less than two kilometers away, walking distance from here. And that job is going to put money into my account, even if it's not the most money I ever earned, certainly. Believe me, I was working for like $12 an hour yeah. U- US, but I was working hard mm-hmm. because I didn't want to be living only off savings. Sure. I would rather be breaking even. Breaking even is more of an achievement than spending your savings. Right, of course, yeah. And so I was thinking to myself, but I can get an Uber share from this side of town to the other for $4 mm-hmm. and I'm earning $12 an hour working 48 hours a week. I was working six days. Right. So therefore, you don't need to outlay like large amounts of money. Don't outlay it if you don't have to. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. If you get a big seven-year gig and you could you, get, you sign a seven-year contract for a TV series or something like that, sure. and you want to buy a car because you need to drive to and from studio and this show is going to be a big thing, mm-hmm. 
do what you need to do, man. Yeah. But until you get that big gig, don't overreach yourself financially. Right, right, right. But that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Maybe somebody else has done it a different way. And sure. You're just saying that I'll, you did this and it worked for you. I busted out of there pretty much because of COVID and have a shitload of great contacts and friends mm-hmm. that I still talk to. But I didn't like lose $50,000 to mm-hmm. go and live over there for two or three years. You know, And even $50,000, I've heard this guy is successful now, so I can't say who he is, Bob. So he can kind of say this. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, like, he, so he's American. He's like, oh, dude, like to have a good time in LA, to live in LA for a year, you need at least $100,000. And he was talking about 100000 USD. Right. And I was thinking, bro, I am living very, very within my means. Sure. And you do not need a hundred. Like, where are you partying? Right. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even party. Yeah. I just work. I reckon probably to live in LA, you could probably 30 to $40,000 a year USD. Mm -hmm. If you're renting. Nowadays or back then? Uh, That's, that's, that's accounting for inflation of nowadays. So my rent was probably like a thousand dollars or a little bit more than a thousand dollars times 12 months but that was that was one room in four bedroom share house right, right. so that's twelve thousand let's call it fifteen thousand um and then to live as well to eat to get around transport another 15 so there's your thirty thousand usd for the year cool and to be honest with you i so i had money put away from previous shows that i had done sure you know the shows conspiracy neighbors mako but i did not want to live off of those savings Mm -hmm. in la Mm -hmm. so i just worked my ass off and i broke even and i still got all those contacts like i met danny over there now danny's essentially running distribution on on our films yeah that's massive you know i'm working on the queenslander with danny and look how close this is getting you know if you say, oh, you're going to make all these contacts, Taylor, and you're going to have to spend $50,000 over three years to do it, I'd be like, okay. But what if I was to say to you, you're going to break even and you're still going to have all those contacts mm-hmm. and friends? Then that sounds like a good situation to me. Do you have any advice on, let's say somebody is wanting to go over there. They, mm-hmm. you know, they have an agent or whatever. They have some management, but they want to make some contacts that they can keep after they leave and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. How do you, how did, maybe not how did you go about making contacts, but how do you think, I mean, you can say that if you like, but how do you make good contacts in LA that you can keep? I mean, it's a case by case basis because everyone's different, but Mm -hmm. I think the way that I just made good contacts was just by being myself Mm -hmm. and just being nice to people. And if people have a problem, helping them solve it. Did you meet the people at parties or at between auditions or where did you meet these people? Anything and everything. Right. Parties work out on the street mutual friends Mm -hmm. anything and everything when you're there you're there right and you're going to bump into people Mm -hmm. and i haven't even told you guys about like i mean i have told you a few but like i also bumped into like some absolute Mm a-listers through friends of friends and Mm -hmm. you're just thinking like holy shit like that's so when you're there you're there that's what i'm saying you're going to meet people just naturally sure there you go cool isn't it yeah you you broke even in America, made sure. a lot of good t- contacts. Sure. What is what goes into the decision to go? Okay, do I want to keep staying in America or do I want to come back to Australia and try and like nurture things again? Was it ma- mainly like the ICM thing? Or no, not really. It wasn't mainly that because I I did go back for a year afterwards with another mid tier agent um, and doing plenty of auditions. But really, when COVID hit, I thought to myself, all right, I'm just going to go back to Australia. I'm going to be with my family. I'm going to lay low. Also, Tegan and I were kind of like doing long distance there for for large periods of time. I really felt like I had for this stage of my life, and you really got to feel these things out, like the ebbs and the flows, and you got to be open. I felt like I'd done it for this period of time. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I needed to go back, reconfigure and recalibrate. Even when, now you guys, I I want you guys to believe this. When I was in my mid-20s, home, laying low, playing FIFA in LA, trying not to spend any money, I was thinking to myself, we need to get a production company going. Mm -hmm. There There needs to be a production company going. That is the way to do it. I don't want to give away the trick, but 
that is the way to do it, to build yourself up through a production company so that you do not need to rely on anything, any exterior factors. You can jump in and do your own projects if it makes sense for you to do. Right. Then you can distribute your own project as well, you know. So I just felt like it was time, like I had gathered enough information to be like, okay, I know what LA is. COVID's hitting. I'm going to go home. I'm going to stay at home. And I'm going to start this idea that I've had for years and years now to form this production company. And we have been growing it since early 2020. Mm-hmm. Yep. And this is the phase that I'm in now. Yeah. And like I said at the start, some roads will lead back to LA. I will have to go back there. Yeah. Uh, but right now, I feel like Caligram really is the new frontier. Yeah. No, definitely. I'm telling you. Bo- and so take it from me. I've gone over there. I've worked my ass off. How lucky are you guys? I've explored. <laughs> you play Age of Empires, right? And you know how like the map is all dark <laughs> yeah, at the start? Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, I don't know like what's over there in that part of the map. Like there could be someone else building an empire to come and attack me. I've gone and like scoped out that part of the map and I'm coming back with information. I'm saying here is what it is. Yeah. Do it here for now. Yeah. Build yourself up. I feel like that's a really, really good way. And, you know, a lot of my friends have said to me, we're not surprised at all, Taylor. Like we, we, uh, you should have you should have started this company years earlier. Mm-hmm. They said to me. So another thing, another note in LA, you will get pulled into a Vegas trip at some point, and <laughs> oh no, Vegas that would be terrible. <laughs> I think so. I Vegas is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Vegas is a lot of fun. I blew two grand in Vegas in forty eight hours. Let's go. Let's nice. double that next time. <laughs> I think actually, let's double that. Name. If I'll have to check with oh, the guys, but have I sent you this picture of this um, bar tab that we ran up? I think I you sent... showed us that. Yeah. It's like a nine hundred dollar bar tab that we. How many people? Four of us. Bob, <laughs> that's Bob, nuts. Bob, and Taylor. <laughs> Bob, 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 and Taylor. Uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh man, yeah. crazy. Well, you know what? We're we're getting to the end of probably part one. Yeah, part one of this. Yep, yep. Who knows? We've got a bit more time. Taylor, it doesn't have to be a Vegas story, but do you have any crazy stories involving some bobs that you'd like to share? Taylor's like, no, I can't. Not, n- not, not, not crazy, but do you have any funny LA stories that you'd like to... Some, something to finish finish on? Absolutely, I do not have any <laughs> Vegas stories that I would Great. like to share. Good to okay, know. not Vegas stories. Because Nothing I have happens in Vegas. friends who are doing very, very well. Mm-hmm. And... That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. Some of the bobs are doing well. So, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, we'll do a bit of housekeeping. Um, oh, okay. Yep. Just at the back of the episode here. Cool. So, my dad was listening to the podcast. <laughs> and you can probably see this because you, you can see on my little uh, note. It says, Dad Comic Books. Yes. Okay. So, what dad said is, who said in one of our <laughs> podcasts, some, someone said, who the fuck reads comic books? Yeah. Here we go. I'm in hot water. Noah, now. Noah said it. That and then you, I said, it? yeah, true. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you're both in the firing line for this, right? Yeah. Sure. So dad said, in his generation, he's like, he's like, just so lucky, man. In your generation, the video games that you have, they're like real life. Mm. You can play them and they're like, you, you got big, like, open world games. Yeah. You can do everything that you want. He's like, Comic books were my video games because I didn't have he didn't have anything except like that tennis game pong pong where you'd hit the ball and it was like eight bit yeah I mean that's all you <laughs> I actually was playing um, Zelda two I had a Zelda two that mm. that started my love of the Legend of Zelda series yeah but uh, I think that's a fair point that he makes like he's like uh, people did read comic books in the eighties and nineties that's true we're not because we're, that was I don't the think imagination. we were talking in the context of the eighties and nineties to be fair. When Noah made that comment. True. Okay. Okay. So what you meant to say, we're going to refine for the record, is who in the present day reads comic books? Yeah. My mum read comic books as well. And yeah. And like, I, I know people from that generation mm. who read a bunch of comic books. My dad books. had a bunch of phantom comics. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I guess my, my position on that is like, I'm not saying who reads comic books. What I'm saying is there's not enough people reading comic books in the present day for Disney to put so many millions of dollars into the superhero market just banking on that comic book people will watch it. Yeah. What I'm saying is, yeah, if only comic book fans mm. went to see Marvel movies, they it, would not make a profit. No. That's my point. 
So you're saying that they've managed to widen their audience to like probably the mainstream film I think, goal. I, I totally. Th- the I think mainstream. Hollywood is yeah. Hollywood has managed somehow to make nerd typically nerdy or geeky things part of the mainstream. Mm. Because I know, theory definitely help with oh that. Oh yeah, probably. For sure. I know that back when I was in primary school that like playing video games wasn't really considered cool except by the other people who also played video games put it that way but now like it's there's celebrities who play Fortnite for a living so like that's my position it's just like yeah i I don't think that disney would have sunk billions of dollars into the comic book industry just counting on the fact that people who read comic books even back in the 80s nowadays all of it put together would would buy into it I i don't think that you know the market, the primary market for Disney movies and um, superhero movies is watching them because of nostalgia. I think it's yeah. young kids. But you could imagine how rewarding that would be for like an 80s kid to like yeah. be able to... If you had told me even a few years ago that Spider-Man would be swinging from Thor's hammer that's flying over and oh, yeah. grabbing a gauntlet from like Black Panther and throwing it to Hawkeye with Captain America in the background... And Iron Man in the background, I would not have believed you. Like mm. that is an incredible achievement the way that they've brought yeah. them all together. And I really, really like Infinity Wars. Really, really like it. Mm. They found that they found that tone that worked when I was a kid. I mean, the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies they were huge. Everybody I knew knew about those movies. Yeah. But then there were some of those, and I can say this now because it's publicly acknowledged by people who worked on them that were like catastrophic failures, like Catwoman doing Razzies and Halle Berry herself accepting the Razzie for it but like they tried to start up a bunch of those movies again that Ed, that I don't think it was Edward Norton it might have been the Hulk movie yeah it was yeah. Eddie Norton it is yeah. the one that's like edited like insane where he's oh, like no, on no. pyramids uh, and, uh, Eric Banner Eric Banner's yeah, Hulk movie where he's like throwing missiles into into yeah and, yeah, it's, and it's, it's like split screen it, and... yeah it's ridiculous yeah. looking and, and it would never sell today but like at some point <laughs> I think starting with Iron Man probably yeah. people were like oh yeah I'll, I'll pay to see this this this, this works yeah. everyone can go see it that's the big thing you can yeah. take the entire family like it's not one ticket it's you right. your yeah. wife can come so I'll say to so, so it would be very rewarding for an 80s kid to, to see something like Infinity War sure absolutely yeah. so to, to Taylor's dad and whoever else is listening who's like, I read comic books and I have a... Yeah. I mean, totally. You're to- yeah, I totally get it. There's definitely a market yeah. for it. Noah and I are just saying we personally don't know anyone who reads comic books. Yeah. I honestly and don't. I, 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 also, I, I, I don't either. I would go so far as to say that 99.9% of the people who are watching mov- uh, Marvel movies aren't reading comic books. Yeah. Uh, that's all. Okay, and if well, they are, they're probably reading it because they saw the movie. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's, probably in, turned, it's probably made a bigger comic book audience. Yeah, than it's turned it around. Yeah, yeah. So in the way that Instagram's the modern day business card, are Marvel films the modern day comic book? Or DC films as well? Well, people just yeah. don't, don't read anymore because they don't have to. I know. Yeah. And we've touched on this as well. Yeah. Reading is a dying art, bro. And that is a tragedy. There's a lot of great tragedy. stories that like I was might saying, not heard. Yeah. Like I was texting you the other day, Isaac. Like, Can you imagine how many great stories are just in a book? But no one's ever going to know because people don't read them. <laughs> don't read them. Yeah. 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 It's true. So that's part of you know getting back onto the whole LA thing, a, a sort of goal and like resolution that I've made for myself is that I want to bring a lot of books to screen mm-hmm. in my career. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, I live till I'm a hundred. So that's many more years to do that because these things do take time to set up. And the idea is that you can get quicker and quicker at them as your career goes on because you get more resources, more trust, more rapport. Uh, so I'd like to bring a lot of books uh, to screen. I really would. And if I need to single-handedly drag the industry to Australia and do it myself, I will. That will save me getting a green card. So that okay. sounds good to me. Taylor got the Thanos ring that moves places. Whichever one that is. No, no, the avid Avengers. <laughs> I know fan. his movies. He, I'm a fan. He, he has that thing with the with the thing. You know, he's got the ring things. He's got the rings, and one of them moves like he places. Did, they, they're jewels, Noah. Like so jewels. Hey, speaking of um, you, you, <laughs> Noah, no, I know. You you were talking about just just really he's quick. He's got the rings. I, I feel yeah, I feel boy. Like we, he has the necklace. <laughs> we we that that was a good bit of housekeeping to do, Noah. Mm-hmm. And question. You were talking about Catwoman. 
what's this? Can you guys inform me about this DC film? Was it Cat Girl again? Oh, that Bat got, Girl. Bat Girl. Bat Girl had a ninety million dollar budget. They made the whole film, finished it, and then they canned it. I heard Den. <laughs> I didn't know about. You this. didn't hear about this? They've canned it. Is this recent? Yeah, it's dumb. Damn. It was, it, and it had Michael Keaton's Batman make a cameo. Why did oh, they throw it out? They canned it because uh, they got it. Uh, they got audience tests, and it tested that badly. Apparently. Wow. I heard that. Which Den- is insane. But I also kind of think that I don't. I'm not going to go into this too much, but some of the actors in DC currently, some of the big ones that were in Justice League, are causing some publicity issues for dc at the moment right so i don't know i'm sure that they're doing some restructuring with their timelines because they've got some people that they can't continue with. i find it i find it hard to believe that they would throw out a movie solely on audience test because they'll just recut it until See, they get a positive exactly th- that'll be like yeah right. you know there must, I don't, have, been, I don't there must to... have been uneditable elements out of it that had to do with certain controversial actors who will remain yeah bad. maybe they made cameos that's what i'm thinking you know maybe it was shot too early before they made trips to Fiji. I'm shocked. That out. That if, like, they, if they're really... Mate. You know, yeah. if you're a really smart producer and you've got a particular actor who you think is going to be really controversial or has a higher chance, a higher likelihood of being controversial, if you're smart, you make them like a more time-travelling kind of character so that you can write them out easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if you need idea. to. Oh, they got pulled into another uh, slipstream dimension yeah. and they're jettisoned off and you're never going to see them again. Yeah, we had you to know. sacrifice them for the Soul Stone. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, and then your actors who are much more safe, you can put them in like the characters <laughs> who aren't time travelable. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, like, I don't know, DC has currently, they have Amber Heard that they need to figure out who is in DC films. Yeah. They have Ezra Miller who is major role that they need to figure out. Mm-hmm. They've got to do some re-strategizing. And maybe this just got caught in the restructuring. Can I do a segue now at the end of the episode? We've also floated that we're going to do a PTA series. Oh, yeah. Where we're going to... Oh, I can't wait for that. Yeah, where we're going to talk Apparently about... I'm the most excited for it. <laughs> no, I'm very excited. I'm very excited. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who hasn't seen any PTA, if you're listening... Yes. Maybe check out his stuff, because we're going to do... <laughs> We, uh, some episodes on the works of PTA and then other filmmakers as well. Yeah, we can, uh, it, to rather than saying as well, um, check out all of PTA stuff. It's phenomenal. Yeah, well, maybe but check also it out, you know, check out, right. check out, yeah, we're, we're only living our lives by it. Uh, <laughs> ch- check out sooner rather than later if you don't want them to be spoiled. Hard Eight and Boogie Nights mm-hmm. because we're going to be looking at those two first. Yeah. And then later on we'll be looking at Punch Drunk Love, Magnolia, the Master, There Will Be Blood, Oof. and Phantom Thread Oof. as well. And then we'll all, I'm sure we're going to look at Licorice Pizza too. I've seen all of those except Licorice Pizza, so I'm going to go into my research. Gianni actually told me to check out Licorice Pizza. Yeah. Is it good? I, I love it. I like it more than Noah does, but I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan. Okay. I really liked it. I'm going to go check it out. And the joke that I was going to make about PTA, if you know PTA, firstly, PTA loves his gummy bears. But secondly, <laughs> he loves confectionery gummy bears. Really? Yeah. Does he? Have you heard? I don't know him. <laughs> have you heard when PTA is doing that? He's doing a podcast and he's like, you know what? I just gotta, I just gotta go because I gotta piss so fucking bad. Yeah. There's a video on YouTube called "The Single Greatest Moment in Director Commentary." Just Google that. <laughs> yeah. You'll find that, it. That's what PTA yeah. says. And in what's he true, looking at? Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights. Yeah. yeah. He gets back and he's like, "And here's the shot of somebody uh, snorting cocaine." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in true PTA fashion, I'm gonna wrap it up because I have to go and take a leak. Beautiful. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>